just to welcome everybody, I'm Ren Rennick. I'm the Chief Executive of the Pituitary Foundation, and I've been really looking forward tonight. I think it's going to be a great session. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of housekeeping. So if you want to use the closed caption, so the text comes up on the screen, you can click a, bottom, a button at the bottom that says CC, and you'll get that text. Um, we will record the session, so it will be available publicly afterwards on YouTube. Um, please, if you can stay on mute while you're not asking a question, it just really helps with accessibility, managing the back background noise so everyone can hear. Um, it's lovely if you've got your cameras on so we can see you, but of course you don't have to. Um, and as you, of course, all well will, um, if you can just be mindful that people are sharing their own personal experiences, everyone's experiences will be different. Although, of course, we hope there'll be similarities. Um, many of you, I think, will be familiar with the Pituitary Foundation, but I want to take a moment just to recap on some of the things that we offer. Um, we've been around for over 25 years and we support everyone living with a pituitary condition and their support network, so friends, families, colleagues. We offer two helplines, one staffed by endocrine nurses, the other by volunteers, and both are free for everybody to use. So please do use that resource. We've got loads of information on our website. We're very excited that we're getting a new website soon, but we've also got print resources that we can send to you, and we do campaigning and advocacy work to raise the awareness of pituitary conditions. There's all more information on our website. Please do follow us on social media, find out more on our website. Um, and join in to the community for everything else that's going on. But I know that you're all here for this evening, and I am so very pleased to introduce John Newell Price, who is consultant endocrinologist and professor of endocrinology at Sheffield. And John, we've been so lucky to have him on our board and our medical committee, and he's joining us tonight. He's going to speak using the slides that are up on the screen for 10 minutes or so, um, and address some of the questions that were sent in in advance as well. Um, We'll then open the floor up to questions. If you put your questions in the chat, I'll see if I can pick them out, feed them to John. Um, I'm aware that we've got any questions as we can. So if I can, hand over to John. So thank you, Ren. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm one of the endocrinologists in Sheffield. Uh, we're a big pituitary centre and I have been involved with the Pituitary Foundation now for 17, one seven years. So it's uh, it's been a long time, uh, but I'd just like to echo what Ren says. I think the foundation does a fabulous job uh, in its support. Now, oh, oh, hang on. No, why is that not? There we go. Um, so what I'm going to talk about uh, tonight, and actually Ren, I'm going to take a little bit longer than 10 minutes to talk, if that's all right. I, I'm going to give just a general introduction um, about Cushing's. And I appreciate that for some of you, or may, perhaps many of you, this may be something you know an awful lot about. But I, I have to assume there may be some people on the call who, who don't know as much. And therefore, I'm going to take it right from the beginning. And hopefully, even for those seasoned people, there, there may be some uh, extra pieces of information that may be useful. I think it's really important that I stress that these the, tonight's discussions will a, will only be general. I cannot offer direct clinical advice for your personal situation because I simply don't have enough information in front of me and it wouldn't be appropriate. So if you do have particular questions, um, I advise you to really, in light of what we discussed tonight, perhaps, perhaps with more information, go back to your teams uh, and ask them. So what is Cushing's? Uh, and the, the answer to this is uh, to first say that Cushing, Harvey Cushing, was a neurosurgeon. So he is widely regarded as the preeminent neurosurgeon of the 20th century, uh, originally working in New York and then moved to Boston, uh, originally described Minnie G, the first patient in 1912, and then 1932, then described a series of patients who now bears his name. He was, he was a phenomenon. I mean, he had an amazing group of people. He did incredible discoveries. Uh, he was a neurosurgeon, but his endocrinology was so good that he was actually president of the Endocrine Society in the US. And what Cushing syndrome is, it's the effects of the chronic excess of hormones called glucocorticoids. And in man, the endogenous, i.e. the hormone that's produced in man is cortisol. And for those of you who have had Cushing's, of course, that will be very familiar to you. However, um, far, far more common 
than Cushing's caused by cortisol is Cushing's caused by people taking uh, glucocorticoids, that's the particular type of steroid, for therapy such as prednisolone for asthma or for inflammatory bowel disease or arthritis, etc. And the difficulty here is that if you need to take enough steroids to treat your inflammatory condition, and if you're on it for long enough, it can cause the side effects that actually result in people develops Cushing's. But for the, for the vast majority of today's talk, I'm going to be talking about Cushing's from within the body. And the, when it's caused from in the body, it really is uncommon. And we use the term hypercortisolemia to mean too much cortisol in the bloodstream. And in the US, it's often referred to as hypercortisolism. Cortis cortilism. So if you hear those phrases, either hypercortisolemia or hypercortisolism, I can't even say it, um, then really that, that, that is describing too much cortisol in the bloodstream. But as I'm going to discuss, too much cortisol in the bloodstream doesn't always equal Cushing's. And, and that's why we as doctors and you as patients uh, or as carers can sometimes have difficulty because it can be very tricky to um, identify. So some of the things we think about and people with Cushing's have some of these um, problems to a greater or lesser extent are the various symptoms that I've listed there, uh, such as increased facial hair. There's the rather uncharitable description of quote unquote a buffalo hump, which is really some extra uh, fat at the nape of the neck, some strii that can occur on the abdomen, uh, thin skin and bruising, myopathy, weight gain, red cheeks, acne, uh, swelling legs and feet. And of course, there's all the uh, constellation of uh, symptoms that affect uh, cognition, mental ability, mental fogging, all sorts of things. And I'll come on to that in a bit. And the reason why you get it in such a wide area is because of the wide ranging effects of cortisol. But the change in the mood are really, really common. Um, but the problem is change in the mood are very common in the general population. So whilst the majority of patients with Cushing's will have problems with mood or cognition. Of course, that's a very common problem. And so you can imagine that as a GP trying to see people, trying to tease out the uh, rare person who might have Cushing's. And to put it in context, about four to five million people uh, will have Cushing's. And in amongst that, the, the, the thousands, uh, thousands and thousands of people who may have uh, depression or may indeed have other symptoms uh, that could mimic Cushing's. The onset can be rapid or slow, and you might have to have a repeat tested. And the problem we have in clinical practice and the problem for patients is that lots of the individual features overlap with common conditions, such as weight gain, such as diabetes, such as high blood pressure. But it's when you start gathering more of those in an individual patient that it then becomes more likely that this is being driven by Cushing's. And certainly the things that we look out for as doctors are the things that are associated with what we call protein wasting. So high levels of cortisol actually make your body burn through the protein. So that's why people lose the muscle mass in their arms and legs, uh, and why actually you see this bruising because the skin becomes very thin and, the, and sometimes the stray eye on the abdomen. And in addition, you can get this, this redness in the face. This is all, or these are all signs of protein wasting. And that's different from just someone who's put on weight because uh, of, a, of, of generalized obesity from a simple point, nothing to do with Cushing's. And, and so those are really useful signs to us. But of course, they typically occur only after someone's had Cushing's for quite a long time. And therefore, there tends to be, unfortunately, all too often, quite a delay in diagnosis. You can also have complications that occur at a young age. And of course, we, we, if you've got a young person who's got high blood pressure, who's got diabetes, who's had osteoporosis, or in children, interestingly, if you've got Cushing's, it really stops children from growing. So those are really good things for me and people like me to be thinking about that may trigger the notion that, that someone has Cushing's. And really, I show in this slide the wide range of various different things that some of the Cushing's might have, problems uh, with uh, cognition, problems with heart, 
osteoporosis and problems with obesity, infections, weakness, etc. And the reason for that, at least for the group this evening who are predominantly pituitary patients, you can have this small tumor. Often the tumor is only a couple of millimeters across in the pituitary. It makes a high level of this hormone called ACTH, that's adrenocorticotrophic hormone, that then by sloshes through your bloodstream, locks on to the surface of the cells in the adrenal glands and drives them to make cortisol. And then cortisol has its effect to do all these things. Now you need cortisol to stay healthy. And there's a beautiful rhythm of cortisol with levels high in the morning, very low at night time. And in Cushing's, you just have too much all the time. And because pretty much every single cell in the body can respond to the cortisol, pretty much every single cell in the body is affected. And that's a bit different or quite different from um, some other uh, hormonal conditions where the repertoire of cells or tissues in your body that can uh, respond to a particular hormone may be much more limited. And this is the reason why really in patients with Cushing's, they can have such widespread and different symptoms and they can affect different amounts and different tissues in different people, despite similar sorts of level of actual measurement of the hormone in the bloodstream. So there is a different sensitivity to the effects of cortisol uh, that varies between people. So um, one of the other things I mentioned is that you can have hypercortisolemia without having Cushing's. And here's a list where you have high levels of cortisol, but you certainly haven't got Cushing's. And pregnancy is a really good one. So your levels of cortisol are high during pregnancy, but that individual does not have Cushing's. If you take a, uh, drink an awful lot of alcohol, you can have high levels of cortisol. And I've listed some other features there. And there are some other um, uh, clinical situations where you're very unlikely to have any clinical features of Cushing's, but in fact, your cortisol levels, if someone measures them, will be high. And one of the best examples is if you're on the intensive care unit, your cortisol levels are high and they need to be high because that's allowing you to withstand the stress of the uh, extreme event that's put you onto the intensive care unit. And I'll just list some other conditions there. So essentially, th this slide is just to emphasize the fact that simply having a high level of cortisol does not equal Cushing's. And you can have high levels of cortisol, even when you've got no features of Cushing's. And I, the reason I say that is because sometimes we get referrals because someone's had their cortisol measured and it happens to be high. For example, if someone is on the oral contraceptive pill that pushes up this thing called cortisol binding globulin, CBG, and that means that the cortisol is measured higher, but actually the amount of free cortisol is normal. So these are sort of pitfalls and people may often wonder, well, you know, I think I've got Cushing's because my cortisol level's high, but it isn't, I'm afraid, uh, necessarily always so straightforward. So I'm just going to go through in the next three slides, the main three types of Cushing. So I've already alluded to the fact that you can have a tumor, usually a small benign tumor, usually small, sometimes bigger, in the pituitary, driving ACTH, driving the adrenals, makes cortisols. You get the signs and symptoms of Cushing's. And usually cortisol feeds back to the pituitary and switches off the production of ACTH. But because you've got these tumors, they're resistant to that feedback. And as a consequence, it still makes ACTH. But in fact, any of the normal cells that make ACTH will be switched off. And we'll come back to that because it's important in one of the questions I've been asked about the follow-up from Cushing's. You can also get ACTH from another site. So uh, most, uh, most typically in the lung, uh, you can get a tumor in the lung, or in fact, you can get a tumor in, in many different places, either a tumor or a cancer making ACTH, that then drives the adrenal glands to make cortisol, signs and symptoms of Cushing's. Because the cortisol uh, feeds back, it switches off production of ACTH from the pituitary, but not from the lung. And this is termed ectopic ACTH syndrome. And this, of course, is useful uh, to know this because when we do fancy tests like Petrosa sinus sampling and we measure the amount of ACTH coming from the pituitary in this circumstance, it'll be very low whereas it'll be higher in the periphery. In contrast, in the previous situation, 
where we would measure ACTH in a proteroidal sampling from the pituitary, it's high, much higher than the periphery. So that's why we use these fancy tests to try and discriminate between these two things, because sometimes these tumors are so small you can't necessarily see them on imaging. And then finally, we've got adrenal cushing. So this is a uh, either an adenoma, uh, a benign tumor, a hyperplasia, or sometimes a cancer that makes so much cortisol that you get the signs and symptoms of Cushing's, that feeds back and switches off ACTH. And there is no ACTH, hence this being called ACTH independent Cushing's. But of course, the most common, as I mentioned, is if people are on steroids, so either creams, tablets, inhalers, uh, and particularly at higher dose, or actually sometimes patients are on other medication that prevents the body from metabolizing uh, these medications. And as a consequence, they develop Cushing's and they have switch off of ACTH. But here, the crucial difference is they've got no cortisol. So if someone uh, comes to us with the signs and symptoms of Cushing's and their cortisol is very low, this tells us that they are likely or will be taking some form of uh, tablet, or they may not always know it because there are some, for example, uh, over-the-counter drugs or drugs on the internet that contain high levels of steroid that does this. So, and a classic example of this is some of the skin whitening creams that people buy, and they put this on their skin in great doses, and unfortunately, sufficient to cause them Cushing's and to switch off the production of cortisol. For the rest of the talk, I'm only going to talk about uh, endogenous Cushing's. I show this slide um, simply to say that Cushing's disease, relevant to the pituitary um, uh, community, is by far and away the most common form of Cushing's. The ectopic, which I mentioned, less common, and um, sometimes you can't find where ACTH is. Um, and then the adrenal causes are less common. Previously, when I gave this talk, I, I noticed around back in 2021, someone asked me, well, what are the different genetic causes of Cushing's? So in case uh, there are keen scientists on the call, here is a list, and we've got increasing numbers uh, of underlying genetic diagnoses. I mean, there's really been an expansion in our knowledge in the last five to six years of the different genes that can affect Cushing's. Now, some of these uh, where you get a change actually in the tissue. So in Cushing's disease, there's a change in a particular gene called USP8, or actually now USP48 as well, which in the tumor drives the Cushing's. There are also, not in pituitary causes, some adrenal causes, some genes that people inherit, which means they're more likely to get it. And then there is uh, multiple endocrine knee, palasia type 1, MEN1, and it's possible that, that some people on the call may have MEM1, and that can cause uh, Cushing's disease as well. I just wanted to mention about the way we think about diagnosis, because it, it may uh, give some insights into the delays you experience and perhaps some of the frustration you may have experienced, and indeed some of the frustrations that the clinicians seeing you may experience. And also I've been asked a question about cyclical disease, which I'll come to. And really we approach this, or I approach this in three main ways. First, is there a clinical suspicion? And that's far and away the most important thing. I have to make a value judgment when I see people to assess whether or not I think it's likely they've got Cushing's. And if that's the case, then I would go on to do some uh, biochemical testing. But, I will not go to do any other testing until I'm absolutely sure someone's got Cushing's in the first place. And the reason why that's so important is because it's very easy to start making mistakes if you're not sure someone's got Cushing's first. I can illustrate that is that you may say, well, just get on, do an MRI scan of the pituitary. Well, 10% of the normal population have got an abnormality in the pituitary. And of course, 10% of the population do not have Cushing's or indeed any significant pituitary problem. So these are just subtle changes on the scan. But don't forget, unfortunately, in Cushing's, the subtle change is what you may see. And around about 40% of patients with Cushing's disease are on the pituitary. There's nothing to see on the scan at all. So it's this clinical suspicion and then some tests to find out if someone has Cushing's and then one would go down to work out what the cause is. Oops, this is frozen, give me a second. So 
How do I assess for hypercortism? Well, you will, I suspect, have been uh, familiar with these tests. We've got the dexamethasone suppression test, and that's asking the question, is there resistance to glucocorticoid or steroid feedback? You've got 24-hour urinary free cortisol. That's the total secretion of cortisol over the day. And then we use late night uh, salivary cortisol. Uh, we used to use um, blood cortisol, but in fact, we now use pretty much in everyone late night salivary testing. And that's to look at this rhythm, which is lost in Cushing's. And those are the three tests. And that would get me to point two. So I've got, if I've got someone who I think is likely to have Cushing's and I do these tests and they show that there is hypercortisolemia, then I'd go on to the cause where we move into these tests, which include other measurements of ACTH and other testing, pituitary scans, other scans of the body looking for ectopic, uh, and this uh, um, complicated test called inferior petrosal sinus sampling, uh, which I can talk about if people want to hear about it. So one of the questions that was sent in is, how is a diagnosis of cyclical Cushing's made and how long can the intercyclic phase be? And I have to say, if I could answer this question, then I would probably be in a position to retire because my work would be done. It is very difficult to give a clear answer to this question. And the reason why I'm going to say that is I'm going to just illustrate some of the problems. Here, uh, I was asked to give a talk about cyclical disease at our British endocrine meeting uh, for endocrinologists um, in November 2019. So I just took a case which I had seen the, the, the month beforehand, and I had an email from uh, a doctor in Sweden asking for some advice. Uh, and this was uh, a 67-year-old man who had suddenly presented, had very, very severe high blood pressure, a very low potassium in the blood. And if you have high levels of cortisol, your potassium can be very low. Serum cortisol was measured very, very high, didn't suppress on dexamethasone. Urinary free cortisol was, um, you know, 40 times the upper or 30 times the upper limit normal, but he didn't have any features of Cushing. So this had come on very, very rapidly. And then during the testing, everything improved. It just spontaneously improved. And this is an example of cyclical Cushing's. That's what severe cyclical Cushing's looks like. And it's extremely uncommon. It happens very rarely like that, where you've got someone with profound features and then it just cycles out. What is um, most people concerned about, about cyclical Cushing's is this type of referral, which I also got in the same month and used in my talk, Please be see this 28 year old woman who has long standing obesity since childhood despite dieting, assessed by an endocrinology two years ago, who underwent investigations, including a dexamethasone suppression test. She's got irregular periods. She's been researching the internet and she wonders if she has cyclical Cushing's. This is unlikely to be cyclical Cushing's, but it's a really common question and it's a common scenario because, of course, people are seeking explanations for their symptoms. So the issues for cyclicity is there is cyclicity and there's fluctuation of blood tests. There are clinical features which may uh, change or there may be biochemical features which change. There may be a patient concern, there may be a clinician concern, and there is unfortunately no agreed definition of what cyclical disease is. But it is the case that any of the main types, or any of the two main types of Cushing's, Cushing's disease or ectopic ACTH, can show cyclicity. It's, I think true cyclicity is very rare. And there is uh, this rare condition of the adrenal, which is called primary pigmented nodular adrenal disease, which can also show some cyclicity. So when we wrote the guidelines for Cushing's, which is now quite a long time ago, but interestingly, they've just been looked at and they still hold true. One of the comments we made is that if you think someone might have cycle Cushing's, we suggested the use of urinary free cortisol as a test or some um, late night salivary cortisol tests. And whilst that was true at the time, one of the more important things, I think, is to make a careful clinical assessment. So in answer to the question about how do I diagnose cycle Cushing's, I take, as far as I can, a very, very careful drug history and looking for whether there are fluctuating symptoms, mood, memory, cognition, menstrual history. Is there variable glucose control or fluctuating blood pressure control? Symptom diary, maybe they've taken pictures, Instagram, et cetera, may help. But of course, I'm also thinking about those signs of protein wasting. Are they occurring in the patient and are they variable? 
And part of the reason for focusing so carefully on this is this is a diagram of how variable urinary free cortisols are. So these are individual patients, and these are the values of the urinary free cortisols on four different days taken over a week or so in 150 patients with Cushing's disease. And overall, there is a 50% variability. So when people say, you know, I've got cyclical Cushing's, the blood tests or the urine test may vary. In fact, there is a huge biochemical variation, but that does not equal cyclical Cushing's. It just illustrates the fact that the tools we use to monitor Cushing's or diagnose Cushing's have quite a lot of variability. And in fact, the biological phenomenon in patients, it can be very variable. So you can imagine trying to establish a diagnosis from that perspective can be very challenging. One of the other tools is the salivary uh, cortisol test. And here are data that, again, in about 150 odd patients uh, that, that we published a few years ago. And essentially salivary cortisol values in patients with proven Cushing's varies by up to 50% in a patient. And this just tells you there's a lot of variation in a patient, but again, that is not cyclical Cushing's. So in my view, cyclical Cushing's definitely occurs. It's not very common. And if it does occur, I'm looking for really biological variation rather than just variation in some blood tests. The good thing about salivary cortisol is it's simple, it's cheap, it's very, very sensitive, but unfortunately it's not very specific. And what that means is if you're ill, uh, you can actually have a higher level. Uh, but the good thing is you can take it and post it and that's useful. And there's this really useful, clever thing that the cortisol is converted to another hormone called cortisone in the salivary glands at a much higher level. And we can use that because, for example, I was referred to someone uh, with intermittently massively elevated levels of salivary cortisol, huge levels, no clear history of cyclicity and lots of symptoms. And when we did the test, the late night salivary cortisol was a hundredfold the upper limit of normal, but the late night salivary cortisol was just above normal range. And what this meant is there was some contamination from hydrocortisone, uh, from things that were being taken, uh, not from within the body, because hydrocortisone is actually cortisol. So we are able to get some ideas uh, from that, but there was no evidence of cyclicity really. So how do I approach cycle Cushing's? Is it likely to have it? Symptom diary, biochemical fluctuations really common. Uh, I warn patients about false positive tests. I do other tests uh, as necessary, but I don't move on to a differential diagnosis uh, until uh, really I'm absolutely sure. And if necessary, I just arrange to repeat things. Uh, and of course, uh, there's always the opportunity to ask or have clinicians ask somebody else who's seen more of it and can take uh, different views or perhaps more advice. So I hope the clinicians will phone a friend if they're not sure and won't start going down the differential diagnosis line until they're sure. So just about Cushing's primary treatment is to remove the disease where possible. Medical treatment can be used for any patients. Bilateral adrenaline can be certainly an option if uh, surgery is ineffective or it's not possible or after surgery being done or radiotherapy hasn't worked. But of course, patients are then left on adrenal replacement therapy lifelong. And for Cushing's disease, you can use pituitary radiotherapy, uh, although in Sheffield, we use uh, quite a lot of gamma knife because we're the, the national center for that. And if it's appropriate, we try and pick whether it's gamma knife or pituitary standard fractionated radiotherapy uh, is more appropriate. There was a question of what does the finding of Crookes change in a path report mean? So I show a path report of Crookes change here and the little black arrows, if you can just see, point to a cell and the cell's got this ring around it here, shown actually most easily in this slide B. So this is slide B and what these are is there are sections. So whenever you have an operation, your tissue is taken, it's uh, put into some uh, stuff called formalin, and then it's put into some uh, paraffin and that's left for several days. And then sections are cut and then things called antibodies are used to different types of things. And this here is an antibody to a thing called cytokeratin. And this ring of cytokeratin illustrates Crookes change. And Crookes was a, a pathologist. 
And what it indicates is that there has been hypercortisolemia. So that's useful to know because this is in the uh, normal corticotroph cells of the pituitary that are not in the tumor. And it is just illustrative that there has been excess cortisol because at times when you do an operation, you don't actually find the tumor. And this is useful because it allows us to be you know, more sure the patient, you know, the patient who's had the operation generally did have uh, Cushing's at the time. Next question was how long, uh, oh, I said dose, dose, that's meant to be does, does it take to recover from Cushing's including the time taken for the own body's cortisol to start again? So just after pituitary surgery, there's three main outcomes. You've got great success where you've taken away the tumor. There's no ACTH. No ACTH means there's nothing acting on adrenal, so there's no cortisol. You may have partial success where you've removed most of it. There's a little room of tissue remaining. Some ACTH drives the adrenal to then make some cortisol. And you've got failure where, unfortunately, the tumor's left in place. You've still got a high level of cortisol. But in each of these circumstances, the normal cells in the pituitary that would normally make ACTH are switched off. And that switch off, so here's a normal situation. After an operation, what happens is the cells are switched off. Because of that, there's no ACTH and the adrenal glands then wither and atrophy and the cortisol level is very low. So when a test is done after an operation, then there will be no response, for example, to synaclin. Now, I should say that after a successful pituitary operation, there's no place to do a synaclin test at six weeks. And I'll come back to when I would be doing a synaclin test and follow up. However, as time goes on, months later, a bit of ACTH starts getting secreted. The adrenal glands get a bit bigger. Cortisol level still low. And then finally, with more ACTH being made by the normal remaining pituitary, the glands grow up and they recover. But during that period of time, patients will need to be on hydrocortisone. So in terms of follow-up, and those of you who have been through this will be very familiar, the first thing that I will say to patients is that after an operation, usually for some months or up to a year, you may well actually feel worse. And I think it's important to warn people about that. Here is someone who's had a very successful operation. That's a very low level of cortisol at 37 nanomoles per liter. You'd normally want to see a level of about 300. And this is the hydrocortisone doses in milligrams they're taking. Gradually, that's being reduced. As time goes on, the level of cortisol is gradually getting higher. Lots of problems, feeling aches, pains, plethora. But as time goes on, the patient feels a bit better. Note that took up to 18 months. And what I do is I continue doing this until the cortisol reaches around about 200 nanomoles per liter. And you'll see that the dose of hydrocortisone has just been tapered down. Once the level of uh, cortisol is around 200 nanomoles per liter, then I'll do the synaclin test. And I suspect many of you had a synaclin test. That's then responded, and that's a normal response. And then what I will then do is a dexamethasone test to make sure that they suppress fully. But the point of showing this slide is this takes a long time. Uh, the reliance on hydrocortisone um, uh, has to be monitored. And typically, I'll monitor most people uh, every three months or so and then gradually extend it. That said, if it's taken a long time for your body's own production of cortisol to start, that usually then bodes very well for you having a lower chance of getting a recurrence of Cushing's as time goes on. The question about, well, how else if unfortunately muscle strength uh, and uh, cognition and mental fogging are some of the, the, thing, the type of things that people um, really complain about. There's cortisol breaks protein and that gets muscle weakness and it can often last months to years. And this is just simply a, a, a graph showing that uh, in fact, the, the muscle weakness diminishes and can just take an awful long time uh, to, to improve. One of the questions was, if you have regular periods post-Cushing's, can you have healthy children? I'm delighted to say absolutely yes. So uh, whoever asked that question, uh, if your periods are regular, there's, there's no reason to think you shouldn't have uh, entirely healthy children. So, uh, Ren, I'll hand back to you, but I can just summarize that I hope I've illustrated that it's pretty tricky to diagnose. 
it's due to the steroid medication is by far and away the most common cause of Cushing's, but I'm guessing that almost everyone on the call will have either been in contact or have had endogenous Cushing's from within the body. The biochemical tests are tricky. They need lots of thought how to interpret them. Uh, there are differences in the levels of skills amongst endocrinologists and knowing how to interpret and use them. And unfortunately, for reasons we don't understand, the effects of Cushing's can last a really long time, even after remission. And one of the ways I sort of conceptualize this and discuss with patients is, well, you know, you, you think it's probably taking you a couple, two or three years, perhaps to, to, to get to this point where your Cushing's has been identified and diagnosed. It's going to take a similar sort of time to really get you back to, to where you are. That's assuming all the treatments have been fully effective. And I haven't uh, gone into all of the different uh, types of treatment that patients can have. And of course, if the Cushing's is persistent, then life becomes more complicated and there's many more uh, other things that need to be done. Uh, but with that, Ren, I'll stop sharing and pass back to you. Thank you so much, John. That was um, fantastic. I sort of feel my brain is awash with information um, and it was really clear. I'm going to give you one of the questions. I'm going to try and pick them off in order. Um, and the first one is <clears throat> Vera, who's asking on behalf of a friend who can't be here. Um, is it to be expected that you still get excessive bruising, hair loss, hair growth, hair growth, nausea, headaches, body aches, etc. six months into it, into it. She's been on, oh, I've lost it, lost my notes, sorry. Um, is Teresa and hydrocortisone tablets with satisfactory cortisol blood reading. Um, okay. She's asking for her 21 year old friend who's had to give up her uni course because of the above. Okay, well, I'm sorry to hear that. What that tells me is that the Cushing's is not controlled. So Isteresa is olisodrostat, which is a newer uh, adrenal blocking mm. agent. It's not actually available in the UK uh, on the NHS yet. Um, there may be some patients who are on it because of a clinical trial. But if there are features of Cushing's, which it sounds like there are, it doesn't sound like that's been fully effective now one of the potential adverse effects of hysteresis is you can actually increase what we call the androgens, the hormones that can contribute to hair growth without their necessary being cushing. So I, I think, again, this is one of the cases where uh, your friend needs to go back and, and, and talk to their endocrinologist. If, if they're on that drug, then I would only anticipate that there's an endocrinologist who's familiar with, with using it. But no, in our, the short answer to your question is, uh, I would not yeah. want to see someone still getting so many symptoms. Unfortunately, um, regardless of how effective the drugs are, regardless of how carefully we try and use them, I'm afraid that even in the very best hands, you still have the situation where it may not be possible to fully control Cushing's in, in the way that you achieve when you've had a highly successful um, isolated operation and your own body's cortisol production has recovered. Uh, and that's an ongoing problem with all the types of medical management that we use because they don't restore this normal rhythm that you you have over the 24-hour period. Thank you. Um, Colin has got a question asking if you can say something about crisis Cushing's. Uh, I'm not sure what Colin means by crisis Cushing's. Um, if, if, if he means uh, very severe Cushing's, then... Um, if, if someone's got really severe Cushing's, it can be a life-threatening thing. We need to do everything to lower the cortisol extremely quickly. We use a combination of different drugs, uh, uh, either both tablets and sometimes infusions. Uh, usually we need to bring the patient into hospital. And at times patients may need to have um, urgent uh, adrenal gland surgery, whatever the cause of Cushing's to save their lives. That's very, very uncommon, fortunately. If Colin's referring to adrenal crisis, when someone's had Cushing's and they're on um, uh, hydrocortisone replacement or other glucocorticoid replacement, well, that's where if there's a, a, a intercurrent illness or trauma and they're unable to take the tablets, then you can end up with too low levels of steroid in your bloodstream, and that can put your blood pressure down uh, and make you very unwell. Uh, and that's where you need medical attention to have many more, much more steroid. And that's why we give patients in that scenario a hydrocortisone emergency injection pack. Pituitary Foundation's got lots of information uh, to talk about that and videos on how to actually do the injection. And I'm pretty sure that Pat did that. Thank you. 
Can, can I just also ask, um, I, I was in hospital for five months uh, while they diagnosed my Cushing's. First of all, it was heart failure. And then they discovered it was Cushing's and it took a long time to get the medication balanced. Um, and so far they have not been able to find a, a tumor. Um, so I continue on blockers. Yeah, on blockers, really, on uh, metyrapone and midurine and so on. Um, and that's been for six months now. Um, what happens when a tumour can't be located? And they've done all sorts of scans. Uh, so in between, so you, I'm assuming this will be what I will call ACTH dependent Cushing's. So that's either from the pituitary or an ectopic source. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, that's, that's what's been and, mentioned. And, and, and if, if you had a petrosal sinus sampling study proving that it's not from the pituitary, then unfortunately these can be one or two millimeters somewhere in your body and therefore can be incredibly difficult to find. In that circumstance, if your um, clinical state and you're able to keep taking your medical treatment and yeah. it's not working and you're well, but you can stay on that. Yes. At any stage that didn't work, well, one could go down the route of having a bilateral adrenalectomy. Yeah. And the other thing to say is that um, there are fancy scans, things like gallium dotatate PET CT scans, which you may or may not have had, which may often be negative when Cushing's is very severe. But when people have had the cortisol levels improved and often improved for some time, six, 12 months, yeah. because cortisol switches off the thing called the receptor that allows us to see the tumor with those scans, when you lower the level of cortisol, you can then, in some people, find the tumor by repeating the scan. I see. Yeah. So it, it depends. It depends on if if someone was in a state where either they were getting fed up with, all the tablets weren't working, or they're getting lots of side effects. You in that in 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 the circumstance where you can't find things, you're very likely to then discuss about a bilateral adrenalectomy because that, that will be this. If someone's stable, well, you still have the opportunity to find the tumor. Of course, if you then find the tumor, remove it, then they're fixed. So. Um, uh, it, it, it depends on and on, on very much having that individual conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Can I just go back? One of the questions that's been posted in the chat is from Rachel, who is currently on dexamethasone for brain mets. Her last scan was stable. She was told to wean back from three megs to her normal replacement hydrocortisone. What is the format for doing this, please? And I think I'm understanding the comments right that she's been in this situation before and it's been really unpleasant. Yeah. So, so again, I'm sorry to um, hear that. The, uh, the, the reason why dexamethasone is used is to reduce the swelling around the cancer in the, the, the brain. And the problem, of course, is I'm assuming you've been on it quite a bit over quite a lot of time, and therefore you'll have switched. Of time. Yeah, and last switch. time it went on for quite a few weeks, and I had the whole face, the stri eye, whatever they're called, yeah. um, yeah. and the muscle weakness, um, and yeah, the weight gain, all, all of it. <laughs> so your own body's production of cortisol will have been switched off, hence the reason for being on the hydrocortisone. Yeah. What the body doesn't like is um rapid switches and and so reducing the dose if you've been on a long time relatively slowly will help now from the perspective of blood pressure being maintained and all the other things you could go from your dexamethasone dose and just just take the hydrocortisone and stop the dexamethasone but you may feel a bit lousy doing that and so the answer to your question i think is to discuss with the people are seeing you, uh, and they can discuss with the endocrinologist. The options would either be to make a slower reduction of the dexamethasone. So, for example, if someone's on three milligrams, to go to uh, two milligrams or go to three milligrams, and then two milligrams alternate day for two or three weeks, and then gradually reduce down. Alternatively, one could stop the dexamethasone, but be taking a higher dose of hydrocortisone, and then gradually reduce that. Of those two things, it's probably simpler just to stay on the replacement dose of hydrocortisone and gradually wean the dexamethasone. 
But if, if anyone were to find that that... Oh, I didn't be... stay on the hydrocortisone. So I've j they've just switched me completely to DEX. So... So, so the dose of hydrocortisone that people take for replacement is minuscule compared yeah. to three milligrams of DEX. So there will be no harm in just taking the hydrocortisone. As well. As well. And they're yeah. just weaning off the DEX. Wow. Okay. That's really, really helpful, actually. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I've got a question. Prednisolone doesn't come into it anywhere. Is it? Okay, I, that's I, anti inflammatory, isn't it? So as I said at the beginning, I do hesitate to give detailed personal yeah. advice okay. for all the reasons. I, I think it's something that that, that really um, you and others on the call should should discuss with your clinicians because it's just not right for me to give that yeah. advice. Completely, yeah. I'll get in touch with Adam Brooks because that's where I am. So. Thank you. Um, I've got a question from Martin who's asking if gamma knife is possible when the tumour isn't visible on MRI. Uh, not in our institution, it's not. Um, the, and the reason we, we, I say that is because uh, we really insist on seeing a target. In some institutions in the US, if there's been failed pituitary surgery where, where it's sure the patient has Cushing, so they firstly got Cushing syndrome, uh, they've either had a tumour that was visible taken out and there was histology that was positive, but they've still got persistent disease and nothing seen after the scan, or... They had a petrosa sinus sampling study that proved they had the ACTH coming from the pituitary, but nothing was seen on the scan. In some institutions of the States, they use gamma knife to treat the area of where the pituitary is. Uh, yeah, we, we don't do that. Um, so yes, it is possible, but no, we don't do that. One of the things uh, which is being done, uh, you may be familiar with some of the work at Adam Brooks, Mark Gunnell and others, uh, using some fancy new techniques to try and identify where some of these tumours are. And if that were to identify, for example, a, an area, and then you go back and you see a tiny area on the MRI scan, because in retrospect, you may then see it, then of course, that could be potentially targeted with gamma knife. But unless we have a clear target, at least in Sheffield, and Sheffield is the National Centre for, for, for Gamma Knife, we, 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 we don't do that. And the reason being is because gamma knife is so specific. If you're, if you're shining the rays at the wrong bit, you're not going to treat the patient. Uh, and that's why, but, but that's why the, some of the people in the States shine at, at the whole gland, but actually their relapse rates are, are still rather high, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Nicola's question. She's had Cushing syndrome for 22 years after pregnancy. She had a fractured hip, which wasn't treated first off, so she ended up with three replacements. She suffered several crises waiting for a gallbladder. And she worried chances of sudden Cushing disease. Sorry, I'm afraid you broke up, Ren. I didn't hear that. Oh, no. <laughs> I'll give it another go. So Nicola has had Cushing's disease, Cushing syndrome for 22 years after pregnancy. She's had a fractured hip, which wasn't addressed. So she ended up with three replacements. She's suffered several crises waiting for a gallbladder, and she's worried about the chances of her sons getting Cushing's disease. Oh, OK. Uh, very good question. Uh, the short answer is um, um, unless she has multiple endocrine neoplasia type one, chance of her son getting Cushing's is virtually zero. Um, so, so really one only sees this if you have a, um, a predisposition for genetic. And even then, it will be incredibly unlikely that in two generations you get the same thing. Uh, so if it helps, I manage pretty much most of the patients in the one across the region, and I've never seen two generations of Cushing's so firstly, you'd need the gene, and then secondly, you'd, it would be just very, very um, unusual. So I think the, uh, the short answer is, I, I, I think it's very, very unlikely indeed. I'm just a bit concerned because one of my sons, I know I got the buffalo humps and whatever, he's rather a large set boy, uh, very tall, large set. I know he's carrying extra weight, but you know, I just look at him and think, hmm, so, so the fact that you've told me the fact that you've told me is very tall is very useful because if he had Cushing's he wouldn't have grown. All oh, right, <laughs> he's very tall. Well, then thank I, you. I think I think you can rest assured. Oh, thanks. Fantastic. 
Um, a question from Natalie um, has had Cushing's pituitary surgery in 2017 and has now been told that she's got a recurrence. How often can it recur? Um, and just a, also to that, she's been told that the tumour is too small to remove at the moment. And so are there other ways to stop the horrible symptoms? Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. Um, so the, the if you look at the longest follow up data, there can be recurrence in up to 20 to 30 percent of patients who are initially in remission. Again, for reasons that we don't understand. So these are people who are true remission. You know, they, they had very low levels of cortisol after the operation. It took a while and then their bodies uh, re recovered and then they can they can get their cushions back. That said, if the levels of cortisols are low after the operations and stay low for, for months or a year or two, the chance of that occurring are much less. If the um, tumor is too, so the first thing to say is if you, if you know that it's definitely Cushing's disease, because the first thing we would do is go back, look at all the data, make sure we got the diagnosis right in the first place, check the histology that there was actually um, a tumor making the ACTH to do all that. If one is then sure that there is a recurrence, we do the MRI scans. We, we do several different types of fancy sequences on the MRI scans looking for, for tiny areas. If that's the case, and if you can't see a tumour, then surgeons are often quite reluctant to go in a second time, although that is always an option because the surgeon will go in the first time, even though there's nothing to see, because there's nothing to see in 30 to 40% of patients with Cushing's. One of the other ways that um, this can be approached and is popular in some centers in Europe is patients are treated with adrenal blocking drugs and you wait. And if the adrenal blocking drugs are firstly tolerated and, and secondly effective, then you wait and then rescan in the hope that if there is a small area, it will grow up a little bit bigger so you can actually see it. And then the third thing is, as I mentioned, there are uh, increasing developments in new technologies um, such as the the um, PET scanning at Adam Brooks and I don't want to I don't want to swamp Adam Brooks with referrals but um, and actually for Cushing Cushing's is actually unfortunately not as well um, uh, imaged as some of the other pituitary problems but but there are other ways that might help in that circumstance but I think the first thing to say to you is if you've got active Cushing's at the moment the biochemistry is active uh, and that needs treatment with medicines, and it needs treatment with enough medicines to get things under control as far as they, they can be. Um, and then ultimately, if the tumour can't be found or it's not appropriate, um, there is another way you one, one can have, if you can't see the tumour, one can have pituitary radiotherapy, and if you can't see the tumour at all, that may be the standard fractionated radiotherapy over small doses over five weeks or so. Uh, or alternatively, there's still the option of, of having both adrenal glands taken out. So there are lots of different options. Um, but again, that's a detailed, nuanced discussion with the clinician seeing you who knows all the background details and has got all the information in front of them. OK, thank you. Appreciate your thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm really aware that we've got five minutes I'm trying to kind of get a mix of questions. Um, Verity is asking if you can give a definitive answer about how long hydrocortisone lasts in the bloodstream and why people are being asked to withhold hydrocortisone for up to 23 hours if it only lasts four to six hours in the bloodstream. I have no idea why anyone's been asked to withhold hydrocortisone for 23 hours. Um, uh, if I could clarify, just um, both for the SS, for my morning 9am cortisol results, I'm being asked to withhold my evening dose at 5 p.m. and the morning one um, and then do the 9 a.m. cortisol um, and when I apparently misunderstood and didn't withhold the evening one they said that the 103 cortisol result at 9 a.m. could have been affected by the hydrocortisone this is at Ockdem so they're specialists but nobody can tell me how that could possibly be if it's only lasts for four to six hours. So so it lasts a bit longer than four to six hours as a short okay. Hour. <laughs> um, and, and, and also the, the amount of time it varies and the levels to which it lasts will varies quite widely between patients. Okay. Um, and so and it depends on the dose. Here, what one's trying to do is remove doubt. 
Yeah. Um, and, and so if someone's taken, let's say for the sake of the argument, 10 milligrams of hydrocortisone at 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. or on waking the day before, and let's say for the sake of the argument, five milligrams at lunchtime the day before, you can yeah. be absolutely sure that any cortisol measure the next day is coming from the body. Yeah. If one takes um, the hydrocortisone at 6 p.m. the day before and then pitches up for a blood test at 8 a.m. the next morning and it's 14 hours afterwards, very, very unlikely that any cortisol measured is coming uh, from a tablet, but it's possible. Um, and okay. what, so what one's trying to do is just trying to practice medicine in a way that you are just removing the doubt because when the cortisol is uh, measured in the bloodstream, that may then trigger a particular intervention and you want to make sure that you're not triggering the wrong intervention. Oh yeah, no, mine um, has gone from uh, up and down all over the place. So they're not a bit confused. We, um, if you do have time, you may not have. Is there anything you would recommend? I have um, ADHD and um, so I've been told that my rhythm might be completely out. And so I'm wondering, is there anything, because we are getting readings from 175 to 61 at 9 a.m. I had pituitary surgery 10 weeks ago, which my levels dropped to below 40 um, after surgery. Um, but we're getting such strange readings. I was wondering if you could recommend anything for finding out if maybe 9 a.m. doesn't work for me because I don't have the normal diurnal rhythm. Well, both those levels are fortunately still quite low. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would regard that as hopefully a success. Um, I hope so. <laughs> but but, but um, no, I mean, if someone's got a normal sleep wake cycle or a, or, a, or, or a fairly normal sleep wake cycle, then measuring it in the morning is the right thing to do. Thank you. I'm going to wrap us up because we're out of Ren, time. Ren, if, if I'm, I, I, I can stay on a bit longer if, if that would help. Yes, that would be lovely. So <laughs> it's, it's perhaps so. <laughs> I mean, you said it. This is yeah, great. yeah, yeah. Well, I can see there's still quite a few questions remaining. So um, that's fantastic. I'll, I'll give you a quick one, um, yep. which I hope is quick. Maybe it's not. Can Cushing's cause intense hunger? Uh, well, it does. So, so one of the reasons why people put on weight with Cushing's is it does stimulate the appetite. Uh, and if any of people have taken um, exogenous steroids, prednisolone and dexamethasone, one of the things they were recognised is their, their appetite was increased. Fantastic. And I also just want to note, it's not a question, but Rachel was diagnosed with cyclical Cushing's in 2022, and she's here on the call. So I just wanted to um, you know, recognise that. It's a fantastic well, that, yeah. I mean, talk about how uncommon it is, so it's great that you're it, here. It, well, no, it, it, so, so when people vary in their interpretation, um, my, my view is it's it's because there's no agreement. My view is pretty uncommon to get true, like, like the patient I described from Sweden. That's really uncommon. But having variation is very common. Very, very common indeed. Fantastic. Could you explain, Colin is asking, what the GABA knife does? Yeah, it's a form of very focused radiotherapy. It's, not, there's, it's a terrible name. There's no knife involved. Um, you, you've got... Um, essentially 200 odd um, beams of radiation coming from a cobalt source, all focused at a single point in space. And what you do is you steer the patient, the patient's tumor into that direct center. The accuracy is about 2.2 of a millimeter. And the way you do this is that you have a frame fitted to your head. You got, um, it looks pretty medieval. You get um, you can look on the Sheffield um, Gamma Knife website, and you can see videos of this being done if you like. And you have a frame fitted with some screws um, under local anaesthetic to your skull. And then the uh, patient has an MRI scan with the frame fitted. And because you can see the frame on the MRI scan, you've got X, Y, and Z coordinates, like a GPS map. And that can tell you exactly where the tumor you see on the scan is in three dimensions. And then the patient's laid flat and you basically go in, it looks very much like a, uh, a CT scanner. And essentially you are then maneuvered. So you are directly, your tumor is directly in the middle of that area. And then you may come out of the machine, be moved across and up a bit. And then you've got another one. They're just giving you little spheres of radiation that then built up to actually map out the size of the tumor. So it's just radiation. 
Um, and it's the same radiation as you get with fractionated radiation. It's just giving it in such a way that it's 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 very focused in a particular area. So that's why it's called stereotactic in a, in a very focused okay. area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, there was a question earlier on from Ellie, who is in hospital. And actually, Ellie, I can see you there live from hospital, um, having had her pituitary tumour removed on Monday and her cortisol levels wow. haven't dropped. Yeah. Um, does that mean it hasn't worked? And I know you touched on it in your talk, but perhaps you could speak direct. So usually, so, OK, if if someone has not had, so first thing to say is um, if the levels haven't dropped, then that will usually indicate that it hasn't worked. Yes, uh, it depends on uh, Monday, sorry, now Wednesday, may still be a bit early because you can see in some people the levels drop and sometimes there's delay drop, you know, a bit improved. Now, in fact, we've, we've had patients and it's published that sometimes you can get a drop six to eight weeks later. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's completely failed, although usually you'll see things fail. It also depends a bit on um, uh, how the cortisol is being measured and what steroids, if any, are being used during the operation. But the, in answer to your question, you would anticipate by now, by tomorrow, perhaps by the next day, that things would have dropped. And if they haven't, they may not have done. And the explanation is that either it's not worked or in fact, you may, you know, the, 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 the tumor is in a different site or something like that. But this is where the levels need to be looked at. The surgeons, the endocrinologists will be able to discuss. And on occasion, sometimes there's a discussion around, well, going in for a second time to see if it's worked. But we have got many times patients have had levels which are not completely low. They've improved. And actually later on, they've improved quite a lot more. And some people you've improved, like that slither of tumor I show, but not completely. And so things have improved, but then still need other treatments afterwards. Thank you. Um, Kim has just posted a link to the gamma knife procedure in the chat if you want to have a look to it, look at it. And Becky has said that she had gamma knife in September and the frame was the worst bit. Yeah, and, um, and, and, and she's absolutely right. That is the worst bit. Um, and usually once that's done, the rest of the day is you know, not lovely, but it's not as terrible. Yeah, it's absolutely, once you've had that done, it's just like, I lay there listening to music for 40 minutes and it was done. Yes. Sounds quite nice, that bit of it. Yeah. Um, I've got a question from Nicola. I was given 20 milligrams AM, oh, AM, and 10 milligrams PM for years with no testing. And then after 15 years, dropped to 10, 5, and 5 daily. If I asked to be tested, could I think I could maybe stop taking my hydrocortisone? Oh, no. So um, I suspect this is because um, traditionally, 20 years ago, many people were on 30 milligrams total daily dose in 20 and 10. Um, although many of us use less than that prior to then. There are data showing that uh, the lowest level of cortisol that you can do that gives you enough uh, cortisol uh, in, in most people, that's between 15 to 20 milligrams a day. Uh, is what, what in most people we'd be aiming for. And in fact, you can adjust the dose quite well just on, on weight. But um, if someone has been changed from 20 and 10 to 10, 5, 5 or whatever, um, then that's, that's most likely because the clinician seeing them felt that, you know, you need to try and be on a, on a, a more quote unquote modern regime. In answer to the question about, well, do I need it? Well, that all one needs to know if you need it or not is to have the cortisol measured in the morning. And the way we just discussed it, um, you know, a few minutes ago, having not taken hydrocortisone, and if the level of cortisol is still low, that tells you that you still need the hydrocortisone. They're planning on uh, reducing it to five, five, and five again. Well, um, five, five, and five would suggest that there's probably <clears throat> cortisol coming from the body itself, yeah. and and that that's a bit different uh, because uh, five, five uh, is is five, five, five is a slight. It's not a kind of regime I would tend to use um, because the five in the morning is 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 quite low. But I think that's again, that's where you discuss just with the clinician, ask what your levels are, and ask what the plan is. I mean, I missed my appointment through ill health last time. So I haven't seen him for 12 months. So I see him, I think, in June. Okay. So um, we'll go from there. But he kind of just threw it out the 
you know, I've been taking 20 and 10. And then he went, oh, no, people, you know, I was like, oh, I wish somebody had told me, you know, it might have reduced some of this weight. So. Well, I, yeah, and, and unfortunately, that that may well be be the case. So so yeah. most people, you know, if you're if you're between well, people around 70 kilograms need mm -hmm. usually around about 15 milligrams of hydrocortisone. It's not an exact science. One one has to adjust the dose uh, as well, listening to what what how people are feeling. Okay, thank you. Uh, but but one measuring, question. measuring the levels in the bloodstream after the hydrocortisone, the sort of hydrocortisone day curves, I, I don't think is a very useful thing to do. Uh, it's reasonable to assess if the levels are dropping too much in people who are, who've got symptoms, but but routine use of hydrocortisone day curves is, is not something I do. Thank you. John, I've got a question from Lucy, who is live in New Zealand. Oh, my goodness, um, Lucy. Of course, the morning. Wow, um, And Welcome. she has persistent Cushing's and is on metropanone and cabergolin. I can never pronounce those. One of the challenges is monitoring her own cortisol levels. She's discovered by monitoring her blood glucose, blood pressure, weight and heart rate every morning, she has a good knowledge of her cortisol levels. If my blood glucose, blood pressure and weight jump up and I have bradycardia, HR under 45, it shows my cortisol has jumped up. This is always confirmed by a 9 a.m. serum cortisol level. I've confirmed this many times. Every time my own monitoring tells me my cortisol is up, my theory is backed up by a high 9 a.m. cortisol. Has any work been done around how patients can monitor their own cortisol at home without having blood level done? This could be useful for patients who are cyclical and trying to catch a high. Uh, wow, well, it sounds like um, you need to be giving my lecture uh, because you're doing everything perfectly. Um, so what you are describing is the important thing. What you're describing is the clinical consequence of the cortisol rather than just measuring the level. Um, and it's a bit variable. So in some people, there may be a very close correlation between the levels of cortisol and the impact that it has on diabetes, hypertension, et cetera. In other people, less so. But if in your particular circumstance, that's found to be the case, great. Um, so yes, if someone has uh, the ability to measure their blood pressure and measure um, blood sugars, then that, as I suggested in the, in the cyclical uh, issue, is a good way to get some handle of whether things are cycling in and out. The other way, if someone's known to have Cushing's, is use of salivary testing. You can just spit into a tube and send it in the post, and you can give patients a series of tubes that they can be able to do that. I hesitate to do that when the diagnosis isn't completely known. Occasionally we do. Uh, I'll give an anecdote. I was once referred a patient who had had 180 late night salivary cortisols measured and one was abnormal. And the referral was, please see this patient with cycle cushions. And of course, that was just one abnormal test because it was just a, a, a blip. But I think if you know that you've got Cushing's, a way to measure the cortisol is um, in, in the saliva. There are some near patient testing done so a bit like a, a blood glucose monitor for for cortisol being developed and in fact there's one that can be read by uh, an iphone used in underdeveloped countries that just works on a colometric uh, strip in much the same way the blood glucose one does and the uh, phone camera can then be used to uh, analyze the amount of cortisol and it's pretty good but of course it's it's not used much where you've got access to laboratory testing which is more accurate Thank you. I'm going to um, have five more minutes and, and finish up at 7.15, if that's OK. Um, we've got another question. Is, Matt, forgive my pronunciation, bradycardia linked to Cushing's? OK, bradycardia and it's metaropone and cabergoline for the other one. Um, the uh, No, not directly. Is, is in, in, in fact, you often get a bit of a tachycardia, fast heart rate. And the reason uh, being is that cortisol... Uh, impacts in the way that the other hormones from the middle of the adrenal gland, the adrenaline, and also the nerve endings, the noradrenaline actually works and enhances that. So often, in fact, the pulse rate's increased a bit. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Nora is asking, after a year of various wrong diagnoses, made a full recovery over the next year, got rid of all steroid medica medication. Her question is that she thinks it's affected her brain and sometimes she thinks she has signs of dementia. 
Okay, and it's a horrible thing for you. Um, and yes, those what often people describe as a sort of mental fogging, difficulty remembering, uh, sometimes um, higher uh, activity. And absolutely, cortisol at high levels with Cushing's is terrible for your brain, and it can last a long time. In most people, uh, it, it does improve, but occasionally people do get long-term um, problems. And, it's, and this is where at times a, psych, a psychology assessment can uh, help to see if there's any specific sort of processing type uh, things that can be uh, helped with by specific uh, exercises or indeed um, additional measures. But yes, unfortunately, in some people, um, what you are describing is a direct long term effect of the Cushing's. Hopefully, although it's a year on, hopefully as time goes on, it will improve. Thank you. Um, Verity is asking, how often would you suggest 9am cortisol should be done after surgery in order to monitor for the pituitary waking up? Uh, I do it usually three monthly until the morning cortisol has reached around 200 nanomoles per litre. And at that point, I then do a semaglutin test. Fantastic. Um, she's also asked very helpfully whether it's possible to share your slides that you've done, John, and whether you would be happy to circulate those, which we uh, can obviously do. Yes and yes. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Oh, I've lost my place on my, uh, my readings. Sorry. I'm going back up to the top and there's a question from Martin asking if it's normal to experience long-term pain six months. Sorry, long-term, I missed that. You, you broke up again. Petrosal sinus sampling, long-term pain after the sampling. No, that would be unusual. Um, I, I, uh, the, the, uh, so often when the test is done, people can get some discomfort in the ears um but there shouldn't be long-term pain and if there is then you need to go back and talk to the people who did it or not do it to talk to your endocrinologist thank you um i'm going to finish us there there's a couple of questions that we haven't got to but we're so grateful for your time john um it has been Pleasure. really wonderful to hear you speak and address all the comments and i'm sure we would all join in our thanks for you it's it's a, it's a pleasure, and Ren, I should say how privileged I've been to have such a long association with the Pituitary Foundation, Absolutely. and also um, for me, when I listen, when I come to the meetings the Pituitary Foundation organise, and I attend uh, the evening session, and, and I take your questions, and also the, the patients that I see in clinic, you know, you guys teach me the things that are important to know about, and therefore we can adjust our research and hopefully get better answers and just do better by you. Well, thank you very much. Um, this session will be available online. It will take us a little bit of time just to edit it and put it together, but it will be on YouTube that you can find from our website. Um, many of you really kindly donated when you signed it up for the talk, and we are reliant on donations. We have no government support at all. Um, if you're able, please consider becoming a member if you're not already and being part of the magazine. And it's a fantastic way to keep up to date with our resources and support our work. Um, so thank you all very much. And I hope you will be in touch for other events and using our resources and helplines. Have a lovely evening. <laughs>